Wonderful. Well, welcome everyone. I don't want to hold this up anymore because I know everyone's anxious to get into things, but first off, I just want to thank our sponsors for making the Passport Series possible. People's Gas, Giant Eagle, Highmark Health, UPMC Health Plan, EY, Evoqua, PNC, and BNY Mellon. Um, we've had a wonderful uh, program so far and we're looking forward to today and to wrapping up this week, but to saying so long, not goodbye. We've got more coming from the Passport. Uh, this fall and this winter. So with that, I am happy to pass this over to Justine, um, who is going to talk a little bit about um, her role as a shareholder and chair of the Emerging Technology and Mobility Group for Babst Callen, so a founding member and leader of the Pittsburgh Space Collaborative, um, really growing a regional space ecosystem to continue putting Pittsburgh on the map as a global leader in space. So Justine, thanks so much. Allison, thank you so much, and uh, thank you for uh, co-hosting and chairing this uh, Passport series. It's great to be here. Thank you guys for joining. Um, I am not an engineer. I'm an attorney. Um, I can see the eye rolls and yawns, but we are equally important to the business of getting humans and uh, assets into space. Um, I am a partner at a regional firm, Babs Calland, uh, and the chair of our mobility and our emerging technology practice. Um, but if there's one caveat, it would be that there's plenty of space careers available to folks that are not just traditionally engineering oriented. And I think we're seeing that, especially with some of the new uh, commercial space companies that are coming online. Um, but one of the things that I'm really excited about is uh, with Astrobotic, I've, I've had the pleasure of representing Astrobotic and working with them for over a decade in a number of different capacities and have seen the company grow from a team, a spin out from Carnegie Mellon and a team of about 12 people uh, through the ups and downs and valleys of death um, and resurgence to uh, being a company that is now over 80 uh, people strong and growing. Um, and in the last two years, really seeing tremendous progress and really putting a flag uh, on the map for Pittsburgh in terms of its uh, re-emerging role as an asset in the space, in our space history. And so uh, for those of you that don't know, Pittsburgh actually has a very rich history in, in space. Um, Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh's Rock, North American Rockwell Company was uh, involved and really responsible for designing and building the capsule, um, the module Columbia that was uh, in Apollo 11. And with Astrobotic coming online now, it's really a return to the past. And I think what we want to see is a resurgence of uh, an ecosystem around aerospace defense, but in particular commercial space uh, here in Pittsburgh. We think we have the resources and the uh, assets and the intellectual capital with you guys participating to make that happen. Um, as part of my work, so I'm not just the outside general counsel to Astrobotic, uh, I'm a partner working with technology companies in this region, particularly focused on mobility and uh, autonomy. Um, but with Astrobotic and working with them on their journey, uh, I see a, we've seen a tremendous interest from institutional stakeholders, whether it's universities or other industry partners in the region, companies, um, large and small, that actually have a role to play in uh, Pittsburgh's space history, um, new space history. And we're trying to leverage that activity to create a broader ecosystem that you guys can all participate in. Uh, so this year in January, we started informally something called the Pittsburgh Space Collaborative. And it is a, a group of stakeholders that include academia, um, industry, uh, at, at, at you know companies that you might not even think are traditionally space um, companies that are UPMC or Bayer or other companies that may have a role to play and are already sending experiments to the ISS and we're uh, pulling together all those resources to really make the case that this region has what it takes to be the next uh, space ecosystem hub um, and of course that is championed by who you'll hear from today which is Astrobotic. Uh, technology. And so I don't want to spend too much time on that except to say that we are thinking more broadly uh, beyond just a single company about what we can do in this region to enable space access, space commerce, 
human health and um, human health in, in space, uh, research and development around space assets, around advanced materials, around supercomputing and space uh, grade computing and beyond. So stay tuned if you're interested. Um, but I do think that all of us have been really energized and propelled in the last two years to act because of the uh, attention that Astrobotic has received from NASA built on 10 years of experience with them. So without further ado, I can't, I am so delighted and honored to introduce you to Astrobotic Technology, uh, Pittsburgh's a Ride to Space company, making space accessible to the world, um, and their CEO, John Thornton, who will talk to you a little bit about the mission and vision of the company, what they're doing, what they're up to, and then we'll shift into ways that you can participate and get involved if, if that's something you're interested in. So with that, John Thornton, CEO of Astrobotic. Awesome, thank awesome. you, thank Justine. You. Nice to meet everybody. Um, and thanks for being, being online today. I'm gonna see if I can start with some slides just to kind of uh, give a little bit of an overview of the company. You'll have to let me know if they're working or not. Um, I paused them earlier and I don't know if it's gonna go back up. Can, are they working? Can anyone tell? Working? All right. Well, so welcome. Um, so I'm the CEO of Astrobotic and we are uh, a 13-year overnight success um, founded here in Pittsburgh. Um, and we've been through lots and lots of ups and downs, lefts and rights, um, but we've had uh, some big breakthrough years in the past couple of years and just wanted to say a little bit about uh, the company, what we're up to, and, uh, and then we'll also have an opportunity to hear from our our uh, HR and recruiter, uh, Melissa DeMauro, a little bit later, and uh, we can uh, uh, talk about the kinds of roles that we're looking for right now at the company. Um, so first, just to start out, um, you gotta ask why space? Uh, so space is a $360 billion industry worldwide, and only about a quarter of that is, is government. So most of space is already commercial, which is really uh, huge and fantastic, considering that it's only been 60 years of space. So the four big pillars of space are communications, think satellite TV and satellite radio, navigation, you know, GPS in your phone, uh, earth observation like weather satellites, and then, and then there's a large uh, area of defense, think uh, you know, real-time communication and real-time in-theater uh, observation and, and, uh, and, and feedback. Um, so these are really the big four pillars that, that drive a lot of the space industry. Um, uh, and again, it's $360 billion per year industry that is growing uh, every year. So it's, uh, it is not just NASA, which a lot of people think uh, of, of as space. Um, so in the approximately 60 years of space, this kind of puts the big picture in perspective. There's about, about 6,600 spacecraft that have orbited Earth um, and uh, many more to come. This number has probably gone up quite a bit since, uh, since I last updated it. Um, SpaceX, for example, I saw somebody interning there, uh, is on uh, today, um, is putting up a Starlink uh, constellation that, that will add hundreds, maybe thousands of satellites uh, to, this, to this number. Um, and there's other constellations like OneWeb that are, that are adding to this. Um, but interestingly, we've spent about 40 years of the 60 years of space living in space. We've had astronauts living in space for 40 years. So we've pretty much got that part of uh, things handled. Uh, right now, there's 16 nations that can independently access uh, space, and, uh, and of course, we've seen the rise of commercial launch as well around the world. Um, so getting to space, living in space, that's becoming a more routine, regular thing. But if you take one step further out from uh, our Earth and go to the moon, there's only about 65 spacecraft, and the sum of all of the Apollo missions ended up being 14 days. So that's all of them put together, just 14 days. So we really only just scratched the surface of, of how to live on another planetary body. Only six nations have either landed or, or orbited um, the moon. And I, I guess I should um, probably add a couple more for, uh, for India and Israel um, uh, recently orbiting the moon. Um, but, uh, but it's only just a, a small handful of, of nations that have uh, been up there and we're really just scratching the surface again of, of living on another planetary body, which is our biggest step to go outward from, from our Earth. And then if you go beyond that, um, there's only about 130 or so spacecraft that have gone to every other planet and every other destination that we know of so far in our solar system. Um, we've never sent humans beyond Earth and only about eight nations have gone out past the moon. So just to kind of put it in all context that we're, we're very, very active around the Earth, 
just really scratching the surface on the moon and we've you know sent one maybe two spacecraft and in mars's case many spacecraft um, out to the other destinations in space so then the question is why the moon what what is it that uh, it is kind of getting this resurgence, a renaissance, if you will, of, uh, of, of interest and activity around the moon? One of the biggest is the potential for the moon to become a fuel depot. If you go to the poles of the moon and you're in the permanently shadowed craters, these are craters that almost never see the sun. They're, they, they're natural cold traps. So they trap volatiles um, that would otherwise disappear and, and migrate out into space. Um, things like water, for example, it's cold enough in the vacuum uh, that it actually stays in the form of ice. Um, and that's really, really important. And other volatiles like methane and um, other potential sources of fuel and interesting uh, volatiles. But the water in particular is really great because it's, uh, it's water you can drink, you can split it into oxygen so you can breathe it, and you can also turn water into rocket fuel. So that's the big, big key. If you've got oxygen and hydrogen, in water, you split it, condense it, that's rocket fuel. So the moon could become a fuel depot. We could go to the poles of the moon, drill for that water, collect that water. There's lots of interesting ways to potentially do that. Um, uh, collect that water and then you could have a taxi system, for example, a, a shuttle that goes back and forth from the moon uh, up to lo uh, lunar orbit. Um, you could take uh, cargo up and down from rare earth metals and other things that you could be mining on, on the surface. Um, you could also potentially just be bringing fuel up to lunar orbit to refuel spacecraft. There's been studies out of MIT that have shown you could dramatically reduce the cost to get to Mars if you stop at the moon and refuel with moon fuel. Um, so potentially, if we can learn to extract resources from another body like this and use it, we're beginning to learn to live off the land of another planetary body and using resources beyond Earth. And that's really the next major, major, major step for pushing humanity into the stars. It's going to another place and knowing that we have the technology and the capability to learn to live off the land there. And water extraction and putting, turning the fuel could be the first big one. Um, I mentioned mining. An interesting point here is that a lot of the rare earth metal sites here on earth, uh, mining sites here on earth are actually impact sites. So there's these large um, huge rocks that have been orbiting uh, Earth or are orbiting Earth and the Sun and um, and sometimes they hit Earth and sometimes they also hit the moon but uh, a lot of times here on Earth those impact sites are where they set up mines um, so you could potentially go uh, set up those same kinds of mines on the moon uh, and and uh, that's much nicer to uh, to you know to mess up a, a <laughs> permanently um, you know vacuum environment that's never going to sustain life to, to potentially bring resources back here to Earth uh, manufacturing on the moon could be interesting. There could be uh, opportunities to build things on the moon that are, is not possible back here on Earth. You have a natural vacuum environment with a one-sixth Earth uh, environment. Um, the other big one is the exploration and science. Obviously, that's uh, you know NASA's realm of the world, but I talked a lot about the water, and that's a big push right now. And there's another discovery that I think doesn't get enough attention, and that is the caves under the surface of the moon. So the picture in the top right here is actually an entrance to one of those caves, at least we think. Um, and we thought they were just craters for a really long time until we had got enough uh, pictures from multiple different angles and you could kind of see underneath the edges and be like, oh, whoa, there's something under there. Um, so the theory here is that these are sinkholes um, that have popped up probably over lava tubes. And if you can get down inside of it, it could be uh, an entrance to a lava tube network under the surface of the moon. And then why is that interesting? I mean, one, it's just cool. Um, but the other is that if you're inside of a cave on the moon, it's natural protection from the elements. It's just like being in a cave here on Earth and why people settled in caves here on Earth first. Um, so you get protection from micrometeorites, you get protection from radiation that comes from the sun, and it also is protection from the thermal extremes. The surface of the moon, as we see it in the night sky, can get up to 120 degrees Celsius or about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. When it goes dark, when you can't see it at night, that gets down to liquid nitrogen cold. So you've got a huge temperature swing on the surface. If you're underground, you're protected from all of that. So that could be potentially how humans settle on the moon and maybe on Mars and other places in our solar system because these same cave structures exist on Mars. So we need the technology to go in, to learn to, to fly in and around these and potentially to put uh, human habitats inside. So ultimately, wrapping all up, you know, why the moon, we think of it as, as a practice ground, a place to develop the technology. It's the closest place to Earth. It's just a few days away. 
we can go and learn to live off the land of another planetary body and we could take what we learn there and go to Mars and other destinations in our solar system uh, and maybe one day get out of our solar system. So fundamentally what we do at Astrobotic, bringing that all back around, is all of this uh, activity that's going to be headed to the moon needs a delivery system. And that's what we do. We are like DHL to the moon. We take packages from our customers, we bolt them up on a lander that we build, and then we go out and uh, procure a ride to space from um, a commercial launch provider. Um, and then we ride uh, that rocket up to orbit around Earth, um, which, and then we get a kick out towards the moon, and then we deliver those payloads on the surface. That's fundamentally what we do. So we're like a, a DHL delivery service that, that take, take, takes things up to the surface. So taking that end-to-end -end delivery service another step further, we've got landers that can take customer payloads to stationary destinations on the moon. And we also have uh, rovers. So that is, you can be a, science, uh, a scientist or potentially if you wanted to operate a, a resource extraction uh, a tool or something like that on, on the moon, we have rovers that can drive it across the surface. So we have payload as a service, we have mobile payload as a service uh, to take these uh, payloads and customers across and, and on the surface. So our landers can carry uh, 100 to 500 kilograms, our rovers uh, about five to 90 kilograms of, of payload, um, and they, they all can be configured and, uh, and, and uh, designed specifically for the, for, the, uh, for the landing site. You do have different thermal conditions at the equator versus, versus the pole, for example. So um, our manifest. So our first mission, um, we uh, had a big breakthrough last year. We got an $80 million contract from NASA. Uh, we also have a, a bunch of other uh, uh, customers on board this first mission. Um, and our first mission flies next year. This is our what we call mission one with the Peregrine spacecraft. And this is an image of it. It's about uh, eight feet in diameter, about six feet tall. Um, and it carries a, about 80 to 90 kilograms of payload to the surface of the moon. Um, the payloads here are attached to the decks. So those are the things sticking out to the side and all the, the funky looking things that are hanging off that, that's all the customer payloads. Um, so it's uh, NASA, for example, is sending science instruments and uh, we'll, I think we'll see a little example of the kinds of payloads that are being sent up. The other important thing here is that there's six countries uh, that are flying with us. So we will um, more than, almost double or, or triple the number of nations that have ever operated payloads on the surface of the moon with just our first mission. So we're making big strides toward making the moon accessible to the world. Uh, so the lander itself, this is just a little bit more about that. It's solar powered uh, lander. So it's pointing that solar uh, panel towards the sun on its way out to the, to the moon. Uh, it will drop into successively lower lunar orbits, and then it will descend down to the surface. Uh, descent itself is fully autonomous, uh, and it's powered by uh, five main engines underneath with four fuel tanks, um, two, two fuel, two oxidizer that mix together. Uh, they're, they're fluids that basically, when you mix them, they blow up. Um, so if you can aim that explosion out of a rocket nozzle, that's how you get uh, rocket propulsion. Uh, we've got a, a medium gain antenna on here that gets us a little better bandwidth from the surface of the moon. So we'll get about uh, a couple megabits per second from the surface. And that's enough for, um, you know, some good HD pictures and some short video clips and that kind of thing coming back. Um, and what's going to be really, really exciting with this mission is that it's going to be coming back live. It's not like Mars where you got to wait hours and hours for anything to come back um, and, and load and download. It's, it's going to be coming back in real time. So it's gonna be a very different kind of uh, exploration and watching this mission unfold is gonna be really quite fun. So this lander is designed to be a kind of like a pickup truck. It's uh, reconfigurable, but can land at multiple destinations on the moon. So we can do equatorial and polar and go to specific uh, site, put the, uh, we have a precision landing system, for example, that can go on there and land within hundred meters of a target. Um, this is our, our uh, product line, if you will. This is the core of the, the bus of what we do as a, as a company. So what does it look like if we make the moon accessible to the world? What kind of payloads, what kind of customers and stories are enabled? So this is just a sample of the payloads on the first mission. So NASA, for example, has about a dozen payloads on the first mission. The one that's pointed out here is a, is a science payload that's looking at the uh, the terrain and trying to determine what uh, what constitutes the lunar regolith, a fancy name for, for moon dirt. Um, so namely, it, is there water there? And if there's water, what concentration is it in? Is it attached to anything? 
Uh, so there's a whole array of other uh, NASA instruments, but another example of a payload that's coming with us is from uh, Mexico. There's a, a payload from the Mexican Space Agency on board our mission. And what's uh, really exciting about this mission in particular is Mexico could be the fourth nation after China to operate a payload on the surface of the moon. Uh, and that's really exciting and obviously a great honor for us to be a part of that uh, for, their, for their country. So they are partnered with a, a university in Mexico. Um, I won't try to pronounce it, but their logo is on the, on the slide here. Um, uh, and they are building up the payload uh, that, that will go to the surface of the moon on our first mission. Another example is a commercial customer from uh, the UK called Spacebit. Um, this one's just really cool looking. It, it, it's, uh, it looks a little Terminator-esque. Um, this is a, a, about the size of a CubeSat with legs. And uh, this little guy is going to walk across the surface of the moon, do exploration and, and uh, technology demonstration for the commercial company. Um, we also go to the farthest reaches of the other side of the world. We have a, a, a payload from Nepal. So there was an astronaut that actually brought a moon rock to the peak of Everest. Uh, and now a piece of Everest will be sent back to the moon. Um, so completing the circle. Uh, uh, and we're also partnering with schools in the area of, uh, of Everest uh, to incorporate art and other, other things into a time capsule to be part of that mission. And then of course, uh, we've also been, been looking to partner with Pittsburgh. Um, so here in Pittsburgh, we have a partnership with the Heinz History Center. And uh, we, we had a partnership there where we voted on what will Pittsburgh send to the surface of the moon. So there was the terrible towel, there was uh, songs from Mr. Rogers' uh, Neighborhood, I don't know how this would work, but a Permani sandwich um, was, was put up there. Uh, but interestingly, the one that won was actually a, a Kennywood token. So the token that you go and, uh, and ride rides with at Kennywood. So that, that's gonna be uh, uh, sent up to the surface of the moon on our first mission to represent Pittsburgh. So this is just a snapshot to kind of give you a sense and the, uh, of the breadth of interests around, the, around going back to the moon. Everything from big time science um, down to, hey, I just want a cool story on the surface and, and connect with my, uh, my, my people here. Um, so it's really interesting to, to see the interest uh, around the moon. So a little bit about mission one and where we're at. Uh, so we've been doing a, a lot of manufacturing of late to build up what's called a structural test model. Here it's called STM. Um, this is a model that we build up uh, that is the full structural parts of the lander and then we go put it on a shake table so we uh, shake it left and right and up and down um, to make sure they can survive the launch because it's getting uh, pushed down and in into uh, uh, pushed downward with about eight times the force of gravity and then be getting rattled all about and even, uh, most important thing is to make sure that that spacecraft can survive the launch we've also done an engine hot fire test so yeah the, the rockets will turn on when we go that's going to be an important one uh, but launch is scheduled for, for uh, uh, late next year. So uh, just a couple other, I guess this is a video of our, our engine hot fire. <clears throat> so what's kind of cool about this test is that they do it inside of a vacuum chamber, um, which is remarkable because you're creating a huge amount of gas and they, they, managed to be, they managed to pull the gas out fast enough to still simulate the, the vacuum environment. So you saw the bell get nice and hot. Um, this uh, thrust profile was right. The, uh, uh, the, the profiles were right on either side of the you know, startup and shutdown. So we're very happy with, with what we saw from those tests. Um, we've also been working on, on building up our computer uh, for, the, for the Peregrine lander. So the, the computer is a um, home built boards that we're building up, but all of the components are uh, either commercial off the shelf or existing space components. So we're essentially integrating all of those parts together into our, into our computer. Um, and then this is again, the structural test model um, gives you a little bit of sense of scale. You can see a, a, a mini fridge back there to get a little sense of scale of how big the, the lander actually is. It's on its shipping uh, crate right now. So all the black stuff is not part of the lander, it's just for shipping. Um, so you'll also notice some basic boxes there and a, and a vertical uh, black tube, those are all mass simulators, and we will put literally barbell weights in those black tubes to simulate the um, very, very, very heavy tanks. So they're fully filled with uh, liquid fuel, um, which is the heaviest, largest part of the, of the spacecraft. So we just took this out and tested it um, last week and this week. So far, test uh, results look good, and we're, we're very happy with, with, uh, with where we're at on this. So this is, again, just this, the test model 
And uh, very soon we're gonna be starting to work on the actual flight model, which will be built up in our, in our clean room. So, our, so that's looking back, that was our mission one update. Here we are with mission two. Um, so mission two is actually gonna be a rover. Um, this is a rover called Moon Ranger that's being developed in partnership with Carnegie Mellon. I heard somebody worked uh, with Red Whitaker. Um, so he, he's uh, the lead on this project. Uh, this rover is going to the, the pole of the moon and will demonstrate autonomy for the very first time uh, at the poles. And that's an extremely important capability because if you're at the poles of the moon, you have low glancing sun angle. And that means that you have very long shadows and shadows for rovers or, or landers uh, can be very bad because shadows on the moon are very, very cold and the sun turns off. So you lose power and you suddenly are, are stepping into an Arctic chill uh, freezer. So uh, it's really important to stay in the light and autonomy can help us do that because there are times that we'll, we'll lose contact with Earth and autonomy helps us get, get around that. Um, so this is funded in part by a, a NASA uh, award uh, and, and shared uh, uh, with Carnegie Mellon and Carnegie Mellon is really the, 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 the big driver of the technology on this one. Uh, this one's going to fly on 2022. Uh, it won't fly on our lander. It's actually uh, manifested on one of our competitors' landers uh, that's going to fly in 2022. Um, a little bit about the, the rover itself. Uh, it uses uh, laser scanners and cameras to do um, uh, obstacle reconstruction to try to figure out, okay, is that something I can get over or not? Do I have to drive around or can I just go right over it? Um, and that's an important part of the system because the robot has to be able to see in order to be able to autonomously drive around these things. Um, similar kinds of technologies to the autonomous cars. Uh, not everybody uses lasers. Um, uh, some do, some don't, some use cameras. Uh, in this case, there's combinations of to, to put the, uh, the 3D reconstruction back together. Um, we've also been doing some, some testing. Um, not sure if these videos, so oh, they used to be videos. Well, there used to be videos here, um, but uh, we've done a, a, a mobility test uh, structure for the, the rover here. Um, this is it in a slope testing facility. Um, and that's a, a very good test for a, a rover and its mobility system because if you're on the moon, you get light, soft soils that can be really, really difficult to drive in. Think about pouring a whole bunch of flour in your sandbox and um, keeping it perfectly dry and then trying to drive a, a vehicle up a slope. Uh, it's quite challenging. It gets very, very loose. You don't have a lot of traction and uh, it's very hard to, to move forward. That's why these wheels have big paddles on them. Uh, they're not that different than uh, paddles on, on sand buggies that you see uh, that, that will race out in the desert. Uh, the third mission that we have, this is the most recent win. Uh, this is a, uh, a Viper rover that's going to be developed by NASA that will fly to the surface of the moon, in particular the pole of the moon, in 2023. Um, and this one was a big one for us. This was just uh, about a month ago or so we were awarded a $200 million NASA award to deliver this uh, Viper rover to the pole of the moon. Um, this is a major accomplishment um, of, our, of our team uh, really coming together. Um, we went all out on the proposal and all out on the technology to win this, and we're, we're so proud of, of the opportunity, and we, uh, we look forward to making NASA proud. Um, and also a source of a lot of new hiring, so I'm sure uh, Melissa will mention this at, at the end here. Um, so we are carrying the NASA Viper rover. This is a about 475 kilogram rover and interface. Um, so that rover will go to the pole of the moon. It will deploy, and you can see uh, in this picture the ramps deploying on, on the lander. Uh, drives down the ramps, and this rover is designed to go to the dark spots at the poles of the moon. And if you remember in my beginning of my talk, I talked about water at the moon. Well, that's what Viper's going after. It's going to be drilling for water in the permanently shadowed areas uh, to try to find the water, find out what composition is it, it is in. Is it attached to some other uh, thing chemically or maybe physically? How do we get to it? How do we extract it? This is the first ground truth of water at the pole of the moon. Um, there's never been a robot that has ever gone there to actually detect water directly. Um, we've, seen, uh, we've seen signals of it from orbit, but no one's actually been to the surface to find out. So in that you know, long arc of building the capability of, of extracting resources from another body and using it, this will be one of the first major, major steps toward making that happen. 
If we can drill for water, we know what concentration it's in. We can ground truth all of our, our maps, make sure we know what concentrations the water is relative to the, the signal that we get from, from orbit. Um, we then know where the hot spots are. We know where to set up the manufacturing and the, and the mining of, of the water. Um, and hopefully we also know how to then extract the water from, uh, from whatever the chemical or whatever process you might need to isolate and purify that water. Um, so a really, really important major step. And we're just really honored to be a part of this. And, and I think it could, uh, could usher in a whole new, whole new era of exploration and development of the moon. So a little bit uh, about our, some of our technologies. So one of the, the big ones that we've been focusing on of late is the ability to do a precision landing with hazard avoidance. And those are uh, two different things. The first is the precision landing. So we're very used to precision landings here on Earth because we have GPS. You can get down to a few meters accuracy and maybe even less than that with the super precision uh, capability. Um, so that means you can fly planes and you can um, helicopters and, any, and even cars just using GPS. But when you go to the moon, you don't have that. So we're going back to basics. So what this vehicle does is it takes onboard maps that have been loaded uh, a priori onto the lander. It takes pictures of the terrain as it goes over and then we just match up those features being like, oh, I saw that crater in my map. Oh, I saw that over there. Match that up, correlate where you are with triangulation and then you know um, where you are on your map. That's how we can navigate um, with precision. So this will allow us to, to get to about 100 meter accuracy down on the surface of the moon. Well, once we get close to the moon, we also need, in some cases, hazard detection and avoidance. So we have images of the entire surface of the moon from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. This is the NASA orbiter that's been orbiting the moon for many years and has a very successful mission so far. Um, it has high resolution imagery of part of the moon and a lower resolution of other parts of the moon. Um, but even in the high resolution parts, we don't have obstacles um, uh, down to a meter or less. Um, so if, you're, if your spacecraft can't survive that kind of obstacle natively, you need to have some hazard detection and avoidance to look for those rocks and slopes and, and craters that might cause a problem on landing. Uh, so for that, we use a, a laser uh, scanner that's going to be uh, scanning the terrain and looking for those uh, hazards on the way down. So if we find one, we move the spacecraft and, and land at a, a nice safe landing spot. So we've actually built this and tested it. Um, this is a, a, um, a Mastin vehicle out in the southwest of, uh, of the U.S. flying in the desert. Uh, not our vehicle, but it is our autonomy and uh, navigation system on top of this vehicle. So it's going to go up to about 250 meters in altitude, come down from there in a, in a glide slope down to the landing site. We're scanning for any kind of hazards, rocks, and in this case bushes, um, and we're looking for a nice flat landing spot. So we scan the terrain, we build up that 3D map, we run it through a, a hazard detection algorithm. Oh, it you know, identified uh, a nice green spot without hazards, marks it as an X, we do a divert maneuver of the, the lander, and then we're able to land safely down on the surface. Um, so this was actually, as far as we know, the very first time that a rocket, an autonomous rocket propelled spacecraft uh, was uh, navigated autonomously and landed um, uh, with uh, precision and hazard detection. Um, we beat JPL to it just by a few months, so we were really happy about that. Um, so what, what all does this add up to? What can we put together? So this is actually a landing simulation. So we've built full 3D models of the moon and lit them in lunar-like uh, uh, lighting so that then we can call up any destination on the, on the surface of the moon, know what the lighting looks like so that we can simulate landings and also simulate driving across the surface. Um, we don't have imagery of all of the features on the moon with all of the different lighting conditions. Um, so in some cases, we have to interpolate and, and infer what that data actually looks like in between the, the data that we do have. And that's, um, this is another view of that same kind of technology. Um, this is an example of the satellite data on the left. So this is a strip of pictures that the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has taken on the left. The picture on the right is our own 3D reconstruction of the moon with our lighting ad adapted to it showing the same sliver to match up with the satellite data to show that our model is working pretty darn well. Um, so, so again, this is all about creating that you know, simulation environment so that we know what the lighting looks like and uh, at any destination at any time. 
um, so that we can then know how to navigate that site, know how to land at that site, know what the features are and, and what to expect in that area. Um, so I mentioned earlier on the, the idea of mobility across the surface of the moon. This is an example of our smallest scale mobile rover. This is called Cube Rover. Um, very similar to the CubeSat idea. It's the uh, smallest form factor we could build to have a mobile rover uh, drive across the surface of the moon. Um, so this can take payloads from one to six kilograms, provide power and basic communications via Wi-Fi back to the lander. Um, this is a four-wheeled skid steer vehicle. Um, so you can imagine uh, large versions of these taking science suites across the surface of the moon. You could also imagine a small swarm of very small versions of these um, working in coordination with each other or maybe working in coordination with large rovers. So you can imagine a really big expensive uh, like multi-hundred million dollar rover might be really well served to have some really cheap rovers next to them that could drive into the tough terrain or hey go go look over that dark spot over there um, and send the little guy in that you know, it, it's okay if it gets stuck. Um, so that's what Cube Rover is all about. We want to again make space and the moon is accessible to everybody and this is one way to do that to make it possible for uh, universities and corporations the world over to have a platform to build off of to, to send things up. Um, this is what it uh, currently looks like in, in real form. This is a prototype of the chassis. The way this works, the wheels aren't on here yet, but the, the motor casings in the bottom right uh, and left sides is, are there. The payload bay is all the middle part in the middle there. Um, all of our electronics and batteries are in that uh, uh, skid plate, if you will, on the top. Um, and uh, all the payloads are right underneath. So it's kind of like um, those big cargo helicopters that you see with the cargo underneath. Um, it's, it's very similar to that kind of an approach. So this is being built up. We're going to be delivering our first one to NASA at, at, at the end of August. And uh, we've got a lot of interest in this platform and uh, a, a lot of potential uh, for science and other activities to, to be occurring on, on these platforms. So we built a headquarters in Pittsburgh. Um, we uh, um, uh, actually, in the next week, we're going to be opening things up there. Um, we, we bought a building that's about two blocks from the Science Center and two blocks from Heinz Field. It's uh, 47,000 square feet, and I'll show a map of where precisely that is. I think we've got a slide on that here. Um, but what's really exciting here is that mission control will be here in Pittsburgh. It's going to be, um, you know, not Houston we have a problem, it's Pittsburgh. Um, how about not a problem, but a successful moon landing? <laughs> um, it's going to be right here in town. And I think that's really exciting, especially for moon landing, because that's going to be uh, real time images and pictures coming back. And it's right in our own backyard. So we found a building here that's, uh, uh, again, near Heinz Field in a science center so that we can interact with the community a lot. Um, we found a building that has a great internet connection, because that's really important for reliable internet connection to the big satellite that's communicating to the moon. Um, and we've got our mission control in there, and this is a render of that. This room is actually complete as we speak. Um, oh, there we go. This is the, the shot of the uh, uh, where we are on the map. <clears throat> so it's, uh, as you can see, close to Heinz Field over on the north side there. We're in the community of Manchester, um, and uh, it's a great location for us. And we're, we're really, really excited about being here, um, growing, this, uh, growing this business in Pittsburgh and putting Pittsburgh on the map for space. Um, another render of, of the building. Uh, yes, that is maybe a giant lander on the roof. We'd like to try to find a way to do that and get the city to approve that. Um, so with some luck, we might have a giant lander on the roof. Um, and the whole idea there is for, Pitts, for Pittsburghers to know and be proud of what we're doing and say, you know, Pittsburgh's not just about steel and the Steelers and um, and, and hockey and that kind of thing, we also fly landers and land on the surface of the moon. We are a high-tech mecca. Um, we also want to share all this with, uh, with the community. So we're, we're, look, we're working on plans uh, to uh, potentially, potentially have part of the uh, area open for, for visitors to come through. So more, more details on that to come. We're keeping that a little, little closer held right now. Um, but we do want to share the excitement of, of uh, lunar exploration with the, with the community. Um, so all in all, we really want to create this. We want to have our landers flying and landing on the surface of the moon, deploying our rovers, deploying payloads, delivering customers to the surface, and doing it again and again and again, making it to the point where, oh yeah, there was a moon landing last week. That's cool. Um, not 
as it is now, which our first landing would literally be the first time that uh, the U.S. has landed on the surface of the moon since Apollo. And, uh, and that's almost 50 years ago now since the last Apollo has landed. Um, so it is certainly time to go back and, and time to, to make our stamp uh, uh, permanent. And what I really liked about this video for the Pittsburghers on, online right now is this is not CGI, this is real video. Um, this is actually taken at a place uh, a little bit south of the city called Lafarge, and it's an old slag heap. Um, so slag is the leftovers from the steel industry, the tailings. And if we go out there with a big bright light at night, it looks just like the moon. So if you want to fake a moon landing, we got a good spot in Pittsburgh. Um, so anyway, that, that's what we want to do and, and, and create. And we want to make it, a, again, a reusable regular thing on the surface of the moon. So I think, yeah, we got a video with sound and hopefully this works. Mission sequence start. I'm sure some people are thinking, we've kind of already done the moon. We went there in the 60s, right? Why spend all this time and money to go back? Humanity has an inevitable destiny in space and a moon landing enterprise is absolutely essential uh, to deep space exploration, uh, development, and uh, science that is yet to come. The moon is our nearest neighbor and it's a place where we will need to go to learn to live off the land. It's the natural next step. This is the moment in history when people will look back and say that this is the turning point for pushing humanity deep into space. There is no uninventing and there is no going back. These transformations are forever. So thank you. Um, that's Astrobotic. Uh, and I think we've got some time for some questions if anybody's got any. We do. And I'm going to call on people so you can ask them directly. Dylan, do you want to jump on and ask your question? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. I have a, a ton of questions. So you can <laughs> cut me off whenever you want. Just one. Um, we're going to have, we're going to get to some other people. <laughs> okay. That's, that's fine. Um, DHL has one truck model that it purchases thousands of and ships things all over the world. Is the Peregrine Lander the stepping stone to a future where you guys have one model that you mass produce and constantly land and offer that as a, as a purchasable item to other customers that you can, you know, they can go onto your website and purchase a Peregrine Landing or they can go on your website and purchase a, a Griffin land or something like this. Is it a mass producible item or is it a demonstrator? It is, the intention is to be very similar to the model that you talked about there. Um, in that also in that um, we're gonna be building our own landers, right? So we're gonna build our own Griffin, we're gonna build our own Peregrine, but we're gonna build it again and again and again and again. And it will be as close as spacecraft can be to mass produce. Um, there will have to be some slight tweak uh, each mission. So depending on the destination, if you're equatorial or polar, um, there's, there's uh, you know, solar panel configurations and other things that you might have to adapt to that um, really kind of changes. But the core of the spacecraft, we want to have the same every time. Same launch vehicles? Launch vehicles are, uh, we can go with different launch vehicles on each one. And the good news there is that there is a robust commercial market for that. So we can, uh, we can adapt to whatever the, the market uh, uh, is wherever the market's pointing. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Dylan. Uh, a couple questions around payload and mission. John H., do you want to ask your question? Uh, sure. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, John. Hey. Uh, hi, John. Uh, when carrying a lander as a payload, are there additional factors taken into account for the landing sites and hazard avoidance? I know the Griffin lander has the two-sided dismount uh, rails or the two, you know, ramps down, yep. but are there any programmable th things in the hazard avoidance that says look for a larger area or something along those lines? 
Yes, for sure. So there are a bunch of things involved in that. So even on Peregrine, the one, one that yeah, might still be pictured here, um, there's some of the payloads hang off the decks. And we need to make sure that we don't get too close to any hazards that could hit that or, or landing even on any kind of slope or any kind of dynamic activity that could have the, the lander lean into that. And it's similar with Griffin, but different geometry. Um, and you're correct to point out the ramps because we, we do want to make sure that our landing ellipse is safe enough, um, our landing area is safe enough that we can deploy those ramps without sending the rover directly into a crater or across uh, tough rocks to, to navigate. So that is part of the plan on, on descent. All right, thank you so much. Tracy, you wanna jump in and ask your question? Sure, so my question is more about the business of space. And I'm kind of interested in obviously understanding you have client contract deliverables. Those are, you know, core dependencies. But have you thought about like licensing any of your tech out for additional revenue streams that then fund the further work that you want to do so you're not 100% relying on contracts? We have thought about that. Um, for the, the delivery side of our business, we want to own the, uh, the lander and we want to own the, the development of that. But there, are, there is a whole other part of our business that we call our future missions and tech group um, that, we would, that we are looking at licensing opportunities because there are interesting techs that they develop that may not align directly with our core product offering and service offering, but we still want to make sure it gets out there um, and is able to be used. So um, yes, but for a, a select part of the business right now. Thanks, Nate. I see you have your hand raised. Sorry, I apologize. First Zoom meeting, new Zoomer. Um, first off, I'd like to apologize. My son's right next to me. But uh, my question for uh, John, um, with, the, with choosing to go with ULA and the Vulcan Centaur, um, I, I recognize that the Vulcan Centaur and ULA are, are using um, Blue Origins engine the 1B4, which is a methane-powered engine. And uh, it just seems, uh, to me, a vulnerability. Um, you're going with a rocket that's never been launched before with an engine that's been test-fired for only two minutes. And, all, uh, and when you're going into the moon, you're using a Mon 25, which is a slightly tested new uh, hypergolic. So, Going forward, I was just curious as to why Vulcan Centaur and um, why go with, why, what went into the decision to go with ULA over companies like SpaceX? Sure, thank you for the question and, and very well researched. Um, so yes, we are flying on a, a, Vulcan, a, a, Vul, a Vulcan flight on our first mission. Um, the reason we picked that is that ULA as a company um, is a very successful company over many, many years. And Vulcan is simply an upgraded Atlas V. Yes, it's got a new engine, you're correct to point that out. Um, but there are, most of the components come from the Atlas V, which was a very, very successful launch vehicle that never had any failures. Um, so we felt uh, looking at Vulcan and ULA as a, as a provider, a launch provider, uh, we felt even though that is the first one, we felt that that was commercially, uh, from a risk perspective, commercially equivalent to, uh, to the competition. Um, we liked what we saw from the uh, business side from ULA. They, they were very competitive on the commercial front. Um, and uh, that, that, that is the way we went. There's a <laughs> um, lot more details can't talk about, um, but, uh, uh, but you're, you're correct to point out those risks, especially the risk potentially with our own propulsion system. It is um, a, a non-traditional uh, uh, kind of fuel that is designed for spacecraft, deep space operations. Um, we went that way partly because it was already in development and looking good for, uh, for, for deep space developments. And we thought we could get some extra traction and support around that. And we did. Um, and uh, we're excited for it as, as a fuel going forward. Um, but uh, you know, it, like it is with everything, it's it's a balance of many many factors that come together to to decide uh, the, these uh, uh, technical decisions, and it's and it's not always just the technical front. I appreciate your answer, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nate. Kermit, you want to jump in? Hello, my name is Kermit. I'm an undergrad mech and aero at WVU with some experience with uh, NASA competitions. 
I was wondering if Astrobotics had done any, uh, has done any research on the plume effect slash problem with uh, landing on the moon, or are you guys contracting uh, uh, GNC software slash hardware to other companies? Great question. So the, the plume effect problem, for those that, that haven't looked at this, is the, is the interaction of the, the rocket plume or the engine plume with the soil, uh, the, the lunar regolith. The problem there is that you're in a vacuum environment, you're coming down and hitting essentially fine powder. I mean, think that flower idea again with a really high velocity uh, rocket exhaust. And what happens to that? Uh, what happens to the material? So uh, we, there is some evidence to this. Um, we've, we have a video, for example, from the Apollo missions. We have video from the Chinese missions that, that show um, the soil. Um, from those studies, uh, so far, the theory is that most of the regolith goes off at about a one to two degree um, uh, uh, angle off, of the, off the surface, so it's very low angle. But we also know that it's really high velocity and can cause a lot of damage. So the, one of the Apollo landers, for example, landed next to a surveyor uh, spacecraft on the surface of the moon. And when the astronauts walked over to the surveyor spacecraft, they found that half of it was sandblasted and totally just worn away. And that was the half that was pointing toward, the, toward their lander. So their lander had kicked up all that dust and just sandblasted the, uh, the surveyor. So the question really for us is, you know, if, if you've got this high velocity uh, dust, what happens to it? Where does it go? Is it going to come back on us? Is it going to settle on any of our instruments? Um, we have done some studies. We have partners that have done some studies. We feel pretty confident that it's going to be uh, uh, going outward, even though we have a multi-engine configuration. Um, and if we get any that, that comes back up, that it's going to be um, uh, protected inside of our, our um, uh, bottom cylinder, if you can see the, the bottom interaction with where we attach to the launch vehicle. We'll take a few more Z. Do you want to jump in with your question? Uh, yes, I would love to jump in. My name is Zagam. I am about to start a PhD program here at West Virginia. And I just had some technical questions about your robotic design and navigation. So I read some papers in which like they will run simulations with different designs and um, like the computer will learn how to make the best design on its own. Are you employing any like such technologies in your own like uh, uh, like space vehicular design or it, is it like a more of like humans themselves sit there and then decide we need this and we need to do that. The design of this part will look like this. Like what's the process with that? Like, Yeah. Yeah. So I, I presume you're talking about like the, um, you know, the evolution kind of yeah. uh, programming that can iteratively try to solve the problem. Um, so far we've been uh, doing it manually um, uh, with ourselves, but uh, that is a very interesting area of research and also a very interesting area of practice increasingly um, to develop uh, some of these components. And what's really interesting for those that haven't looked into this as yet is that uh, some of the outcomes, some of the results of, of that really looks bio-inspired. It looks like you know, a structure from a bird bone or something like that. Um, and there's a reason that it, that happens in, in nature. Um, so I think increasingly, I think there will be more and more applications of that for spacecraft uh, vehicles because every gram counts, every kilogram counts. We, we literally sell um, $1.2 million per kilogram. So there's a price per that, per that gram. Uh, you can work out the math on it. Um, so so you're, you're absolutely right. It, it is a very interesting tech um, and it is something that we're keeping an eye on. And, and I think it is something that we could uh, potentially take, take great advantage of. The other thing that that oftentimes needs to be combined with is, uh, is 3D printing because some of those structures can be so complex that traditional manufacturing processes don't work. Um, but, uh, but that's also another tech that's coming along really, really fast. Um, so I think, think, you know, bio-inspired skeletal structures for <laughs> spacecraft um, and that's uh, not too far on the horizon. So thank you for the question. Uh, one more question. Uh, so do you guys use like traditional computer vision and deep learning for like navigation or is it solely like LIDAR based uh, navigation techniques that you are implementing? So for the precision land or for the precision landing, we use primarily vision. Um, uh, we don't do any uh, deep machine learning on that. It's, pre it's pretty much vision algorithms and matching and, uh, you know, big, basically create a feature map and you line up your features with your results. 
um, uh, for the uh, hazard detection and avoidance, that is where we use laser um, uh, because you, uh, it's harder to see uh, with uh, you know, uh, even a wide stereo baseline camera. You need, you need better imagery to that. So that's, that's where the, the scanning laser um, get, gets you what you need for the precision of the rocks that you're looking for. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I apologize, I know Kopecki is your last name, but that's your screen name. Would you like to ask your question? Hi, my name is Rachel. I'm a graduated mechanical engineering student with a dual degree from Milwaukee School of Engineering and the Lubeck University of Applied Sciences. Um, I was wondering, since a lot of um, different companies and countries are sending up payloads to gather information, if Astrobotics is also planning on gathering information or if they're just gonna be like relying on those companies to share it with them so that they can better develop their products for future endeavors. Yeah, great question. So in terms of data and the instruments that come with us, the way the way we work with our customers, our customers is that the that customer awesome. owns the payload and they own the data that comes out of that. Um, so ultimately we are a transportation system, but we don't own, we're not asking for ownership of that at the end of the day. Um, so uh, luckily, a lot of the data that's going to be produced in the early missions is going to come from NASA, and NASA has a vested interest in everybody knowing, and they'll often publish papers and make it available widely. Um, uh, we are collecting data on the performance of our own spacecraft and, and uh, the things that we think we're going to need in the immediate term for making Peregrine and Griffin better vehicles. Um, and then over time, you're certainly correct that we will be looking for, for things in particular about either uh, advancing our spacecraft or maybe looking at some of the resources at, at the poles when we're, when we're down in there. Um, but short term, we're primarily focused on, on ways that we can be improving our, our delivery service. All right, Brian, you want to jump in? Sure. Yeah. Hey, hey John, thank you for the presentation. Brian. and. Uh, Congratulations, by the way, on the new headquarters opening up. That's super exciting. I'm in Pittsburgh now, so very excited to see that. Uh, awesome. Thank so you. I'm, uh, I guess, similar to, to Nate, I'm interested in like the huge complexity and unknowns of landing something, especially the, for the first time on the moon. Uh, are you able to mitigate these risks by simulating it? You know, can you do enough in simulation or are there physical tests you can do? I know you shared a little bit, but I'm wondering if you could share some more. Sure. Yeah, landing on the moon is hard, and it was hard when Apollo did it, and it's still hard today. As we saw with uh, India's attempt, we saw with Israel's attempt. Um, uh, the, I think one of the best ways that we've gone about mitigating that is, is building the right partnerships and, and bringing in the right experience. Um, so early on, we built a partnership with Airbus, for example, um, and their spacecraft division in particular. Um, that brought a ton of experience uh, into the program. We also had a, a, a development uh, with uh, NASA very early on for many, many years um, called Catalyst. So that gave NASA uh, an opportunity to send their engineers to work at our, our, um, on our lander for many years. So we had NASA engineers, we had Airbus engineers, we had our own engineers. Um, the combination of that uh, gives us more confidence that we are at least doing what we think is the right thing. Um, uh, the other is that we have a, a very uh, diverse set of experience and skill sets that we've brought in and, and uh, hired over the last year and a half. Um, so we probably have at least one from almost every major uh, space company uh, that, that's out there right now. Um, so that, that brings uh, a lot of that experience to, to bear and I think that that's an important part of it. Um, and it's just knowing what, what can go wrong and what, uh, what things to be watching out for and and having that experience of um, you know some some scars of their own to, to know what to be watching out for and I think that adds up to a lot. Um, the other is our internal processes. So we're, we want to make sure that our reviews are uh, attended by by folks with heavy experience. Um, so we we look to uh, uh, to our partners again for for that kind of review. Just to sit down and, and poke at every single system, um, every line of code, everything to say you know is this going to work? Is this going to work? Is this going to work? Um, and then it's, as you mentioned, testing, but there is a, a, a limited amount of testing that you can actually do here on Earth. Um, for example, if we had our lander fully fueled sitting out in the back parking lot and turned it on, it would make a lot of fire and smoke, but it wouldn't lift, lift off. Um, that's because of lunar gravity, of course. It's designed for one-sixth Earth gravity, not, not, uh, uh, not full Earth gravity. 
So because of that, we have to put components in thermal vac chambers. We'll, um, we'll put it in thermal vac chamber with a, a solar simulator, for example, try to get as close as possible to the real thing as we can. We do a lot of simulation. I showed some of the um, uh, simulation tools that we'll use to, for, for the uh, visual navigation, for example. Um, but when it comes down to it, all said and done, um, there is still risk. Uh, we, you know, we're, gonna, we're doing the best we can to mitigate as much as we can, but there's, there's never a guarantee. Um, space is an unforgiving environment and you really only get one chance to get it right. So we're, um, we're, we're trying to do the best we can on our first mission. And um, that, that's where we're, we're trying to pull from as much experience as possible to, to make that a success. So I will be sitting nervously, just like you will probably watching our, our, uh, our launch. John, do you have four more minutes for a, a few more questions? I know you- Yeah, I, I've got a little bit more time. Okay, great. Um, Alana, do you wanna ask your question? Oh, hi, yes, my name is Alana. I'm a rising senior at Pitt and I'm studying computer science and math. I was just wondering, I know all of your technology and research is geared towards you know, going to the moon, but are there any applications for what you're working on here on Earth? So long term, yes, and short term, there's some, there's definitely a lot of crossovers. So, for example, the um, the hazard detection and avoidance and precision landing is very similar to the kind of technologies that drones use. It's very similar to the kind of technologies that, that the autonomous car industry is using. So there is some crossover in algorithms and computer vision and things like that. Um, there is also some some crossover in. Uh, hardened electronics and, and high reliability software. So if you're in a mission critical kind of uh, system here on earth or, or potentially um, you can imagine some DOD applications where uh, you might lose GPS or you might have someone trying to jam you or, or someone trying to mess with your, your software code, um, you, you need that high reliability uh, capability to recover or to detect errors and, and know what to do with it. Um, so there is some crossover. Longer term though and, and bigger picture arc um, I think we'll see more and more of that. Uh, it's, uh, I think potentially some of the biggest ones are gonna be when we start to develop the technology to learn to live off the land of the moon. So water extraction, for example, if, if we can have that at the poles of the moon, can that same technology be applied to our deserts here? Um, can, uh, can we develop technologies that can isolate and extract materials to uh, 3D print um, to create 3D printing powder to create replaceable parts on the surface of the moon. And maybe that same tech could be used back here on Earth. Um, it's, it's really about living in that extreme environment and learning to live in that extreme environment. And I think that's gonna apply to the same extreme environments that we have here on Earth. Thank you. Thanks so much. And just for the interest of time, I'm gonna ask these together, John. Um, okay. Sam was asking it, how much of the landing process is autonomous? And, so, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So the landing process is largely autonomous, and that has to do with the uh, communication delay from here to the moon. So physics says it's about six seconds, but if you add the ground delay um, with, uh, with big antenna dishes and other things like that, um, you might get a round trip of anywhere between 10 and, and 60 seconds. Um, so it can be quite, quite a, a delay. And if you're coming down on the surface of the moon and trying to make a quick, quick decision like that, um, that's uh, typically not a good environment for any human to be in a loop. Um, so our, uh, our system is fully autonomous once landing begins. So we, uh, our orbit is all commanded. Once we're in our lowest final orbit and closest to the moon, then we say, okay, time to land. And we're hands off and watching and just hoping things go right from that point down. And, and it's about, about a half hour of critical descent where we're really, really, uh, nerve wracking uh, right right to the edge there uh, to, to, for, the, for the final landing. And I know this isn't the last question. I know people are anxious to keep talking to you, but um, from Elena, in terms of the live video and images, is that from another company or are you, is Astrobotic using their own imagers? We will have our own cameras on board. Um, in terms of how those are gonna be distributed and all of that, um, we're, we have our business development team working on that right now, so TBD. Um, but the, um, what I can say we, that we'll definitely do here in Pittsburgh is we will definitely have a landing party in Pittsburgh um, in and around our facility, hopefully at other places in the north side, maybe some partnerships with Heinz Field or the Science Center or the War Hall or maybe all of the above. Um, we, we definitely want to make it uh, an event, a big thing that, um, that you know, the whole neighborhood and the whole region can get excited about. 
um, and hopefully a successful one. Well, thank you all for your questions, John. Thank you so much for your time. I know you have a hectic schedule and we really appreciate you taking the time out to, to you know, showcase what Pittsburgh is doing. And, and we're so proud of the work that Ash Robotics doing and excited for what's to come next. Um, I'm happy though to introduce Melissa DeMero who is leading the HR and talent for Astrobotic because they are hiring. Um, and we have a lot of talented folks on the call just from you guys sharing in the chat. So we want to get to open positions and how you can have the opportunity to get engaged with Astrobotic. Hello everybody, thank you for coming. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background on myself. So I am part of Astrobotics recent growth. I joined the company about two months ago and we've been joking that my welcoming gift was that about a week after we started, we won the Viper contract, which means that my first mission at Astrobotic is to grow our team from about 75 people to over a hundred people. So we need lots of new friends. Um, it's really exciting for me. As somebody in human resources, I love people. So one of the best parts of my job is the opportunity to meet so many candidates who come from such incredible backgrounds and are doing really interesting work in the, in the space industry and other related industries. So I am going to attempt to share a screen here. I'm a little bit of a, a Zoom novice myself, so bear with me a sec here. Oh, come on. Okay, just kidding, because my system preferences aren't letting me do it. So we're going to talk through this instead. <laughs> Thank you for your flexibility. Um, I know one of the things that you guys are really interested to know is what kind of people is astrobotic hiring. So it takes a really wide range of expertise to put together a spacecraft. I think you guys could probably pick up on that based off of John's presentation, that there are many, many elements that go into designing, building, launching, flying, landing this thing successfully. So some of the jobs that we're currently hiring for include um, systems engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical, GNC, propulsion, embedded software engineers, RF engineers, um, robotic software. We have openings for people in graphics and simulation. If you were inspired by those rendered images of the moon's surface, we have an opportunity for somebody to join that team. We also have drafting and design positions. Um, it's not all about engineers though. As the company grows, we've also grown our need for positions to support that team. And of course, we have people looking for new business opportunities and new organizations for us to partner with. So we're seeking a director of business development right now. We're hiring our first procurement agent so that we can get a little help on the purchasing side. Um, we're looking for our next mission director for people who have background on the, the project management side of things. And we're also looking for a graphic designer currently. So there are many, many opportunities coming up with Astrobotic. Um, and I'm excited that so many of you are interested in potentially being a part of our team. I think another common question is, what are we looking for? Who are the people that we're trying to hire right now? So technical expertise is a big part of it, naturally. We're looking at, especially if you're just coming out of school, what internships have you participated in? What kind of work did you do? What kind of research might you have been involved in? Who were the professors that you partnered with? What institutions are you coming from and what are their areas of expertise? So that's definitely a large filter for us, but there's more to it than that. We want people who are comfortable collaborating. If you think about that there are over a dozen teams involved in creating the spacecraft. None of them work in a vacuum. I, pun intended, maybe. Um, they all need to have the ability to take their piece of the puzzle and compare it against all of the other elements of the spacecraft to make sure that everything works correctly together. So we really need people who are comfortable in an environment where they share their work and they're open to feedback on their work. 
we're obviously interested in creative ideas. Some of what we're doing has really not been done before, or we're looking for the new and innovative ways to get it done. So we want people who are going to bring fresh ideas to the table, not be afraid to take a little bit of risk. We're looking for people who will take initiative. We're a small company. Um, we rely on our teams to go out and find the right next thing to do, whether that's educating themselves on some new technology or um, just finding a new project, looking for the hole in the plan that might need to be filled. We want people who will raise their hand and volunteer. We also need perseverance. This is not a short-term project. It takes a long time to put one of these missions together and there will be lumps and bumps along the way. Like John said, as a company, Astrobotic has already been through many of them. There have been some changes in direction. There have been new ideas that got thrown out. Um, so we need people who can kind of roll with the punches, who are willing to adapt as they go, learn on the fly, and just stick it out. Look for the solution to the problem, not be discouraged by the roadblock that popped up. Something that comes up when you look at our job postings that is worth mentioning is we are bound by ITAR regulations for export control. And what that means is our candidates need to have US person status. That essentially boils down to our candidates need to be either US citizens or permanent residents. That doesn't mean that our candidates have to be from the United States. On our current team, we have several people who were born in other countries, including Romania and Japan. It's just that those people have also earned either their citizenship or their permanent residence status. And the last thing we're looking for, which is a theme of this conversation, is we really want people who currently reside in or who are willing to relocate to Pittsburgh. We are proud to be here. We want our team to be here. So that's something that we ask of everyone who's going to become a part of our team. Last thing I'll go over that's a common question and then we can get to some of the things that you are all curious about is what is the background of our current team? that will give you some sense of who are the people who are working for Astrobotic today. So I already mentioned we have a multinational team. We have people with a wide range of educations, everyone from associate degrees all the way up through PhDs. Our team has a really wide background of industry experience as well. Of course, there's aerospace in there. Um, there are people who have worked directly in space. There are people who have also worked more on the aviation side of things. We have people who worked in automotive, medical, in the military, robotics, consumer technology, or consumer and business software. Something that we've found is if we had a team 100% comprised of people who were experts in space, we might not come across the fresh ideas that we need to get over an obstacle in our design or development. So we appreciate having a wide range of perspectives in our candidates' professional backgrounds as well. We're also constantly working on increasing our diversity. Um, the space industry, full disclosure, has not always been known for being a very diverse place. So we're proud that currently about 20% of our team self-identifies as either women or people of color. And we're constantly looking for opportunities to continue to grow that diversity. So with that, I will stop talking and let you guys contribute this to a little bit. What can I tell you about Astrobotic? Yeah, Anna, do you want to ask your question? Oh, yeah, sure, I can go. Um, I'm a rising senior in aerospace engineering, so I'll be looking for full-time jobs soon. And I was wondering um, if you could talk more about the work, the work culture at, at Astrobotic. Sure. Um, the culture at Astrobotic, so bear in mind that I'm new to the team, and I have experienced this culture so far remotely <laughs> because unfortunately I haven't had the opportunity to be in a building with a lot of my peers. It's very kind of unfortunate for me. Um, I will tell you what I have discovered about the team so far. They are very open and candid. Um, everyone talks to me like they've already known me for years not like I'm a new person. They've shared their feedback with me, they've helped me, they've offered suggestions to me. So when I say that we're looking for people who 
want to collaborate, that is absolutely a culture that already exists. I think it's also a team that's very driven. You have to be willing to push. We've set ambitious timelines for a lot of the projects that we're working on. So you need to, to be comfortable in a culture where when it comes down to it, maybe you put in the extra hours and, um, and really buckle down for the sake of the mission or for the sake of your peers. The flip side of that is we recognize that the stress that comes along with that pressure to succeed should be offset by some level of work-life balance. So for example, we offer flexible work hours. Um, everybody works a core hours uh, set of 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. But aside from that, if, if you're an early bird, you're welcome to clock in at dawn. And if you're somebody who likes to sleep, you can hang out till later in the day. Whichever way suits your life is fine by us. We also offer unlimited vacation time so that if you need time off for um, a doctor's appointment, a family member's event, you would need, just need to take a long weekend and get off the grid and let your brain rest you're welcome to do all those things as well. We wanna make sure that our team is well taken care of so that they can do the best work possible. Thank you, that was super helpful. You're welcome. Austin, you wanna jump in with your question? Absolutely, thank you, Allison. Um, hello, Melissa, thank you so much. Um, it's really revealing to hear everything you're saying. Um, I, I, as I'm sure everyone else, really appreciates it. Um, my question was, um, I appreciate that you sort of added nuance to all the different roles that go into making Astrobotic um, complete its projects, including roles that might not be as technical heavy, um, like you mentioned business development and um, the procurement agent role that's currently live on your website. So I guess I'm just curious, when you're looking for candidates to fit in those roles that aren't engineers, what makes them especially stand out to you? Um, I know that you mentioned some in your in your um, speech before, and I appreciate those, but I didn't know if there was um anything else? Dustin, it depends a little bit on the role. So for example, um, in our business development role right now, that particular spot requires some space expertise. That's not always the case in some of these supporting jobs. I don't have any space background aside from just being a nerd for space in my personal life. Um, so there are some where we look for some direct exposure to the space industry to support that role. I think the interest in the mission is definitely important. We want people who are bought in. We want people who are excited about what we're doing. But I think, you know, when you're talking about somebody in a role like procurement, or even for me in human resources, or um, we just hired a marketing and communication specialist. Her name's Olivia. We're looking for people who have expertise in their realm. There's a reason that we're trying to hire those people and it's because the current team doesn't have it. So I want somebody who has accomplished something in that arena and who's not going to be afraid to just volunteer that when they get in the building. Um, I can tell you, Olivia, she's been with us for just a few days and she has jumped right in with advice on things like, like branding, how we should do our messaging, what we should be doing with our social media. And I appreciate that so much about her. I couldn't do her job. Does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Nate, you want to go ahead? Hi, Melissa. Um, as a uh, former space systems professional, uh, just transitioning out of the military and going in and working alongside engineers and technicians, do you guys plan on hiring, um, I know you have a broad base of engineers, but technicians as well, is there going to be room for the team as far as technicians go? Or, uh, I mean, I, I'm still in uh, the Air Force Reserve, so I know a lot of um, aerospace professionals, um, but they're not, you know, found as space as I am. My unit actually transitioned to the Space Force, so that was kind of cool before I left, but uh, I know that engineers are, are great when it comes to um, trying different things and the invention. And when it comes to the practical side, um, I realized as an instructor that the technician really helps um, further the innovation part 
And being a new company with a new lander, uh, innovation is definitely a big part of it. So I, I wasn't sure if you guys had planned to hire any aerospace technicians to help along with the mission. Yeah, um, we do have, we have at least one technician on staff that I know of right now because he started around the same time I did. He's an electromechanical technician. So um, I guess the short answer to that question is yes. Our general approach to hiring is organic. Um, we rely on our team leads and our department managers to look ahead and anticipate what they're going to need to deliver on the goals that we've set and we add positions as those needs arise. So I think you're hitting on something important there. It's not, it's not all about design or theory. There is a very practical application to what we're doing. We are physically building a thing. So yes, we need people who can do the high level kind of conceptual work of that. And we need people who can talk about how do you actually put this thing together and make it functionally as good as it can be. So I would imagine you'll, you'll see more of that as we continue to grow. How about Kyle? Thank you, Melissa. Uh, yeah, so I was wondering, you mentioned earlier about how you're currently virtual. Um, I was wondering if you had any information on about like how you're going to proceed with kind of COVID stuff in the future or near future, obviously, because no one knows what it's going to be like in the couple months, but just generally what the company is kind of thinking about as just towards safety and COVID yeah, stuff. Yeah. Um, I will tell you the, the plan changes. It feels like about every other day as we continue to get guidance from the CDC and the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Um, we've been in an interesting circumstance for ourselves because we've been waiting on some construction with the new building. So the new building will be move in ready for us in about a week. That doesn't mean that everybody's going to come flooding back in. We recognize that having so many people in close proximity puts the team at a risk that's probably not necessary in our current circumstances. So we've done a lot of partnership um, between departments and, and specific teams to determine who needs to be in the building, who has the hardware work to do, who needs access to specific tools and labs, and who can continue to work productively from home. So we've given the team a lot of power in that equation to decide for themselves what's best for them, what makes them feel most comfortable and what works for their team and the mission as a whole. The end result of that has been, we probably have about half, maybe a little less than half of the team planning on going into work. We're gonna reduce the physical number of people in the building even more by cutting that team in half and having them alternate weeks in the building. So one team will spend a week on site and then work off site for a week and vice versa. Our hope there is that will give plenty of opportunity for people to maintain distance from one another so that they can do their work and not worry about sharing germs. Um, and of course there's cleaning protocols. Everybody's gonna be wearing masks as per the, the state's guidance. We've put some travel policies into place. Um, yeah. It's, it's an ongoing work in progress. And I think our commitment to this point has been, we're gonna do what we need to do to protect the team first and foremost. And we're gonna look to the guidance from government organizations to tell us what's the standard that we need to meet at this point. Louisa, if you wanna ask your question and just stick to the mission director one so we can get a couple others in as well. Sure. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. All right, great. Yeah, no, I was just curious. I've been kind of following this mission director role that you guys um, have had up on your site for a while. And um, I've noticed that it doesn't appear that any, anybody's been put in that role. And I'm just curious why. Have you just not had a, a diverse enough uh, pool of candidates that are applying that fulfill the needs for that role? What exactly is the whole that? I would say that mission director role is a good example of the ambiguity I was talking about. It started partly because we were just scouting. We had some things on the horizon. We thought that that 
role was going to be necessary. So we put it up there to start to get a sense of who might be interested. Then goals and timelines changed. So it kind of got pushed out we we're talking to people, but we weren't really on a timeline to fill it immediately. Now we're back at a point where we have some things on the horizon again that we're feeling fairly confident that we're ready to pursue. So we're, we're pushing that role forward again. If you could, which you can't, unfortunately, if you could compare the job description that's up there currently to the one that was posted um, two or three months ago, they are slightly different. The department managers put their heads together to think of all the different aspects that this next mission director is gonna to need to prepare themselves to deal with. And they tweaked the job description to address some of those, those things. So, yeah. Got it. Yeah. I'll take a look at it. I, I mean, I've read a little background on the, uh, the other mission director and he's pretty, uh, he's got a lot to bring to the table, so. I yeah. think whoever gets put in that role um, will have to bring a lot to the table as well. So, yes, we do. We have some impressive people on our leadership team in terms of their their experience and perspective. Yeah, yeah. Maya, do you want to jump in with your question? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much uh, for all the information. Uh, my question uh, before I before I start, you also mentioned about uh, working working from home. Um, I just wanted to refer to a study by JPL. Uh, they're actually considering working from home even after COVID. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but there's talks that they're gonna change the roles and they're gonna start working from home and they're actually appreciating this situation. I've seen JPL certainly not alone in that arena. I think a lot of companies are reevaluating how productive teams can be in a, a remote environment and how happy teams can be in a remote environment. So yeah, maybe a silver lining to this whole situation. I do think it'll have some kind of permanent impact on, on how people do work going forward. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, uh, getting, my question is, uh, what, what I wanted to ask you is, is mainly about ITAR restrictions. Mm -hmm. uh, does, does the, the candidates, uh, um, have to be, uh, do they have to be, um, so I know, I know with ITAR uh, certification, being a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident helps, but is it, a, is it an absolute requirement? For our purposes, yes. And it, it has everything to do with the nature of our contracts with NASA. That's not to say that all NASA jobs require, um, you know, that that citizenship status. It depends on the specific work that's going on. And I know, um, for example, if NASA is partnering with an international space agency, that there's opportunity to get involved with that work via those international space agencies. Our specific circumstances are, are sort of narrow, if that makes sense. We have very, um, very specific missions that we're working on for NASA and very specific requirements that we need to meet. So. For us, it does have to be that, that citizen or permanent resident status. And I will tell you, sometimes I wish it didn't because as I screen resumes, there are a lot of interesting people out there um, who are currently citizens of foreign nations and I would be very happy if we could consider them. Maybe somewhere down the road, you never know, things might change. So being mindful of time, um, John, thanks for jumping in and answering some of the, the loose ends questions in the chat. Um, Melissa, why Astrobotic? Uh, you know, what, what's the, the 30 second elevator pitch for talent who's, who are thinking about Pittsburgh and are thinking about space? I will, I'll tell you why it appealed to me. And I think this is general enough that, you know, you don't have to be like an HR professional. I was looking for a company for my next step where I was inspired by the mission and where I felt like I could sincerely contribute, where the work wasn't just being handed to me and I, you know, I was being asked to deliver on an objective that somebody else had come up with. I wanted to be in an environment where I could share my voice, speak my ideas, and have some kind of actual impact on what was going on. I think Astrobotic, between the size of the company and the culture of the company, 
that is 100% an opportunity. So I joke with our candidates sometimes, I, I think that environment can either be exciting or terrifying compared, you know, depending on the type of person that you are and whether you're comfortable in those ambiguous situations. But if you are a person who is thinking to yourself, I want to have a piece of the pie, I, I want to have an impact and a strong hand, then, you know, throw your name in the hat. Give me, give me an email, hook up with me on LinkedIn, let me know what you're all about, and we'll see if there's a good fit for you on the team. I can see the questions are still rolling in, so I think people will be taking you up in, on, on following up in LinkedIn, and I posted the link. Feel free to jump in there. Um, just learning about opportunity and what's going on in Pittsburgh more broadly as well. But thank you so much to John, Melissa, and Justine. This was a fantastic session. We're excited to share this more broadly, too. Thank you all for joining us. Um, just one quick plug. We have a Ethical Hacking CTF workshop coming up tomorrow uh, with Carnegie Mellon and CGI. So whether you're a beginner or you're advanced, there's something for everybody. So if you want to jump in and, and work towards some prizes and do some some skill building that's available tomorrow. And then Friday, we have our summer passport celebration where we'll be talking about next steps, announcing our case competition winners. Um, and we'd love to have you join us for that. So you can check all of that out on pittsburghpassport.com. And in the meantime, stay well, be kind, and we'll see you all soon. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.